we don't know yet, but we're going to get started. And hopefully as people tune in, we can start a little bit more interacting and, and chatting with folks. Um, but yes, hi, everyone, whoever's here. Um, this is uh, Yulia from Starkle Nutrition. And to your right, I think, is Anna. Um, and we're going to be talking hi. about <laughs> self-care today. and. Um, a few other things that I think is important for us to, to share during this time. Um, I'm gonna start us out with a poem. So Do just to kind of help just, us. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, Leah. Do you no, think no, we should like one or two minutes and just make sure more people yeah. are? I love your poem so much. I want as many okay. people to be able to experience that. Absolutely, let's see. Also, if you're here, comment so we can see you and hear from you and say hi to you. So we can hang out for a minute or two. So, Yulia, will you tell me what's going on in Lord of the Rings right now? <laughs> are you well, still reading it? I am still reading it, yes. You are? What I'm, part are you on? I'm on book three right now, and oh I am just barely starting. So Frodo's been taken by some bad guys, and uh, I'm trying to think. I think war is about to break out, so it's getting intense. So by book three, do you mean the actual physical book number three, whatever it's called, Return of the King or something like that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you mm -hmm. know that each volume is actually divided into two books? Yes, yes. I, yes, have, we, I have it on my iPad, so I just oh. like read through the yeah. whole thing. It just tells me like, book three. Yeah. Okay, just one more comment about that. Didn't you love in the end of the last book with Shelob the spider and all that stuff that oh, went down? It was very intense. I was, was getting really intense. scared. I was reading it at night too, which I don't think should have been my go-to. And yes, reading about monsters before bed is not the best thing for me, yeah. but I enjoyed the adrenaline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was so, so, so exciting. <laughs> and it sounds, looks like Katie's on. Hi, Katie. Yay. Hi, Katie. Awesome. It's nice to see folks saying hi. So feel free to, if you're here and if you're lurking in the background, feel free to introduce yourself and say hi. I would love to see you. Um, what did you think of the ants? Oh, yeah, those guys. It's the big tree people, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I don't know. I have to think about how I imagine them and what they look like in my brain. But uh, I'm a big tree hugger. So in general, I was like, oh, this is pretty exciting. I would love to meet okay. one of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how are your guinea pigs like doing? Oh, they're doing good. They're doing good. Um, mm, I told you about the tunnel my mom made and which totally just spazzes them out in a happy, happy way. <laughs> Um, so one of the ones I have now is named Glowin, and if you look in the back of Lord of the Rings, Glowin is Gimli the Dwarf's mom. Oh. Yeah, I, I know it's not, very obscure, very obscure. I've not learned all the genealogy and uh, hierarchy of families yet. <laughs> I don't think you need to, you don't need to learn that. Oh, just in case, if ever trivia comes up. <laughs> oh, hi, Ashley. Ashley here. Hi, Ashley. Yay, someone else is joining. This is great. Yay. All right, so we're at 10.33, so are we ready to get started? You know, whenever so, you would like to, Yulia. Okay. What, yeah. Just to make sure that we have enough time to cover everything we want to talk about today. Uh, oh, there's someone else here. Hello. Hey, Angela. Nice to see folks saying hi. Welcome, everyone. Um, okay, so we're going to get started with um, a poem to help us kind of ground ourselves into what we're going to be talking about. So um, this is really good to just close your eyes and really feel the weight of your body in the chair and just really take in the words. This is a poem by Mary Oliver from, um, I'm not sure which book it's from, but it's called Wild Geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. 
tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. Wow, thank you, Yulia. That's the sweetest thing ever. I had never heard that before until you presented it. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. It's a really, really great poem. I feel like especially right now, as there's so much um, going on, it's really nice to just hear the words, you do not have to be good. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, and feel like you belong to something more than yourself, so yeah. Um, Absolutely, yay. I could feel myself uh, kind of breathe a little bit deeper. Let me read that. Yeah, it helps you kind of settle in, which is really what we're aiming to um, to do here as we're talking about self-care and settling into your body, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, so we both work at Stark Nutrition. I'm the clinic manager and Anna is one of our lovely nutritionists and mental health counselors. And I'm going to let her uh, introduce herself and tell you a little bit more about who she is and what she does. I'm Anna Kanata. Um, I'm a counselor and a nutritionist, and I practice gentle nutrition with people. Uh, I've been at Starkle Nutrition since October. Before that, I was at an eating disorder treatment center. My focus is eating disorders, specifically binge eating disorder. I also work with all people, anybody who wants to heal their relationship with food and their body. Um, I'm a health at every size and intuitive eating practitioner, and we can touch base on those more today, and if not today, a different time. So thanks, Yulia, I'm really glad to be here. It's awesome to have you here, I'm really excited for this. Um, and then just to tell you a little bit more about Starkle Nutrition. So we're a um, functional medicine clinic. Uh, we're located in the university district, although right now we're all remote. So we're doing telehealth from home. Um, and we have nine practitioners now, and they each specialize in a different area of nutrition. Um, and like Anna mentioned, we do provide nutrition and mental health counseling as well. Um, and really just to help you maintain a healthy lifestyle. Um, and that includes mind, body and soul. Um, and our areas of service are um, autoimmune disorders, gastrointestinal issues, diabetes, high cholesterol, um, eating disorders, oncology, nutrition. We really have um, a person to cover something that you need to talk about and also specialize in. So we definitely um, have folks who are really, really great at different areas of nutrition. Um, and then this is a, just a nutrition community hour. We decided to start, uh, start these to help support our community during COVID. Um, we kind of started feeling a little bit isolated and lonely and uh, wanted to mm -hmm. foster a feeling of togetherness and have this um, space where we can just share our knowledge and experience and help our neighbors and friends and family. Um, and so today we're here with Anna and um, I have a few questions for her and we're just going to have a conversation. We're going to be looking at notes throughout. So if we if you see us looking away, um, this is what we're doing. And there'll probably be some awkward pauses and um, some kind of uh, areas where we're struggling. It's our first time. So uh, just a little disclaimer that uh, just two humans here doing their thing. Um, <laughs> So um, to get going, I'm just going to... Um, Before we start, is it okay if I ask the group a question? Okay. And Please, yes. Yeah, thank you so much for the disclaimer. And thank you for everybody who joined us. I'm going to pretend like you're just right here in the room with us. I really miss all your energy. And we're, today we're going to talk about kind, compassionate self-care. But first, we're gonna talk about stress. And I wanted to ask the group chat two things, if you could enter in there. What's your biggest stressor right now? And how do you know you're stressed in your physical body? 
where does stress show up in your body? So your biggest stressor and how does stress show up for you? While they're entering that into the group chat, Yulia, can I just ask you, what is your biggest stressor right now and how does that show up in your body? Um, yes, absolutely. Let's see. I think the sense of isolation is probably my biggest stressor right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, even though I'm an introvert, I definitely get um, energy from just being around people. Um, and with COVID and not being able to be around humans and like read the body language of folks and read the energy of the room, the isolation has been really hard on me. Um, and where I feel it in my body is, um, it kind of sits heavy on the chest. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, um, I think it manifests itself in like shortness of breath and uh, sometimes rapid heartbeat. So just the sense of uh, kind of being stuck and being caged, which is not fun. Yeah. That makes sense that that sense of isolation where it's showing up in your body is in your by your heart. That really makes a lot of sense. So thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you, Anna? I think my biggest stressor is probably being in front of the computer since I'm totally not used to that. <clears throat> And it's a type of stress that kind of creeps up on me that I don't even realize until after I've been here for a couple of hours and then I feel it in my shoulders and I feel it in my neck and I just really long to go look at some green grass. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and it looks like, yeah, go ahead. If you wanted to read a few, a few chat comments, um, that would be great to hear from folks. So Angela says her bigger stressor right now is fear, which totally makes sense. And she feels it in her gut. That absolutely makes sense. Ashley's bigger stressor is work-related. I hope y'all don't mind that I read this out loud. I'm assuming, you know, it's a public information since you're chatting it. Okay, so I'm going to. <clears throat> with GI issues with excessive acute stress, absolutely makes sense stress shows up in our gut absolutely katie's biggest stressor is her expectations for herself Whew, that's a big one for me too yeah. shows up in her body as tightness in chest absolutely gretchen's biggest stress is keeping her family safe oh and it shows up in her shoulders for sure Thanks everybody for sharing those. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like we're we're all experiencing um, something similar even in our different circumstances. So Anna, how does the nervous system play into all of this? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so our nervous system, in connects with our body, right? So we're gonna talk for a minute about our brain and how that works with our stress and our body. We're gonna talk about the triune brain model, which is a three-part model. And I'm gonna use my hand as a model since we don't really have a whiteboard or anything like that. In this triune brain model, we're gonna talk about the reptilian brain first. We're gonna pretend like the palm of my hand is the reptilian brain and it goes down into the brain stem here. So this part of the brain is 300 million years old. This is the sensoromotor part of the brain. This is the part of the brain that's in charge for keeping us alive. It's in charge of things like heartbeat and breathing. It's in charge of um, things like muscle tension. This next part of the brain is the mammalian brain. It's also called the limbic system or the um, the amygdala. I'm pointing to my thumb because that's what we're going to use to represent the, that part of the brain. So it's the emotion center. It's the part of the brain that tells us I'm scared and it connects to the reptilian brain. So it's right in there. It tells the reptilian brain or the reptilian brain tells it. So that's how it connects. Now the top part of my hand is the neocortex or the primate brain. It's the part of the brain that's in charge of higher order thinking cognitive abilities. It's usually folded over like this so it can connect with the amygdala and they can all communicate together. So this is the triune brain model. 
under times of extreme stress, we flip our lid like this, and this neocortex is no longer connected to the amygdala and the reptilian brain. So then it ends up that the reptilian brain is running the show. There's no ne neocortex making the cognitive decisions. Um, I'm just going to flow right into talking about the rest of the nervous system. So when we're stressed, like I talked about, this reptilian brain is what's running the show. This reptilian brain activates our sympathetic nervous system. Now, a nervous system is divided into two parts, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is what's activated under times of extreme stress. This is the fight or flight or freeze part of the nervous system. I have written down some things that increase when the sympathetic system is activated. Blood pressure is increased, heart rate, fuel availability, adrenaline, oxygen circulation to vital organs, and then some things that are decreased during this fight or flight time when our body is just really thinking that there's danger going on, right? And when our body is ready to act, things that are decreased, insulin activity, digestion, salivation, relational ability. I think that one's interesting. Yulia, have you ever had that when you get really super anxious, your relational ability is decreased? Like our face, we can't make the same facial expressions. We might have a glazed look. Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. And I think the, the relational part for me is the language part, which is also offline during high times of stress. And I literally cannot communicate. There are no words to come out. Oh my the God, words that come out yeah. are very inappropriate or very emotional. <laughs> and <laughs> so it's very hard to communicate and be social when you're in okay. times of Yes, I can flight, relate so. 100%. And I'm sure the listeners can relate also. <laughs> And then lastly, I'm going to say that decreases is the immune response when the sympathetic system yeah. is activated. Then on the other hand, we have the parasympathetic nervous system. And it's what I call the rest and digest part of the nervous system. This is when we're a little bit calmer. The neocortex can be more engaged. Things that increase when the parasympathetic is activated are digestion, intestinal motility. So it makes a lot of sense that people were talking about when they have stress, they feel it in their gut because things just aren't working well when we're under high stress. Our resistance to infection increases when the parasympathetic is activated. So our immune system is working better during those times. Rest is increased, circulation is increased, oxytocin is increased, the ability to relate and connect is increased. And so those are, that's kind of a, now we have the groundwork laid for our discussion about self-care. Did you have any questions? Yeah. Did that make sense to you, Yulia? Yeah, I think that makes absolute sense. And it really helps kind of paint a picture of what your body is like in the two different st states. One is the very active you know, danger um, state where I really, what I found fasc fascinating about the sympathetic uh, nervous system being activated is um, all the energy is diverted into the fight or flight. So, yes. uh, you know, like your pupils dilate, your airways dilate, it's like you are ready to run or fight yeah. or whatever it yeah. is, um, which helps me paint a picture of like, okay, this is the state that I'm in right now. Like my body is just ready to do whatever it needs to do to survive, even if the danger is minimal or the perceived danger is not even an actual danger. Um, yeah, so I just really like the two states because becoming aware of when you are in the stress response really helps you try to switch to that rest and digest that you were talking about. Yeah, I totally agree, Yulia. And you're we're kind of setting the stage, um, but you're leaning towards the point that this, uh, the sympathetic system gets activated when we're under danger. And this stress also activates the sympathetic nervous system, even though we might not be under danger, right? Exactly. We're not like, mm -hmm. um, you know, our ancestors that might have, you know, needed to fight a saber tooth tiger. Run away from a like tiger, that. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's not what's yeah. happening, but it is still happening in our body. We're still getting ready to fight or flight. Yes. yes.
Yeah, I think what's really helpful for me to to know is like the stress response is supposed to be cyclical and it's supposed to have a beginning, a middle and an end. Mm -hmm. And when you are in that stress response, a lot of the times there is no end or you don't know how to end it and how to ground yourself back and go from, you know, flipping the lid to back back down. Um, so that brings us to to the self care and how does self care play into it. Um, and I feel like self-care is a really buzzy word these days. Um, you know, there's hashtag self-hair, hashtag treat yourself. There's a lot of um, momentum going into that. Um, so I would love to hear what your take on it is and what you think is self-care and what is not self-care. Oh, that's a really good question. Okay, um, we will talk about that. And before I do, <laughs> I just want to invite everybody else to ask questions if you had any questions so far about the nervous system and we will take a look at those um absolutely we'll as far as self care being a buzzword i am just not exposed to the media right now so i don't i um but it makes a lot of sense right it makes sense that yeah that people would be jumping on that. I think it's what our society needs right now, but I think that people yeah, can get confused about what it is and what it is not. So yeah. first we'll talk about what it is. Um, I Self-care is kind, self-care is compassionate. Let's just talk about care. So Yulia, I know that you have some wonderful house plants. So tell me. Yes, as you can see behind me. <laughs> so if you don't mind, could you tell me about care for one of your house plants? Um, sure. I feel like it's a very grounding and reciprocal relationship. Um, I feel like I take care of the plant as much as the plant takes care of me. So I give it water and sunlight um, and it grows in return and gives me joy. And uh, so in, in extreme cases, extreme joy, because when I see a new leaf coming up, I get very giddy, so it's very exciting. Um, yeah, but it's something, there's something to the physicality of taking care of something and being able to touch your hands to the soil or touch your hand to the leaves and and also feel like you're contributing to something that's other than yourself, I guess. Wow, that's really cool. Um, so, <laughs> that's really cool to hear. So you Did you not expect number, that answer? <laughs> I love that answer. You touched on a number of things and one that I hadn't even really thought of, um, which is the reciprocal nature of the care. And I think that self-care can be kind of the same thing. It can be reciprocal. We yes. ask so much of our body and our mind to respond in a certain way to, you know, to execute activities as we see fit. Um, yet are we really giving our body and mind and spirit everything that it needs? in order to thrive? I guess that's what the reciprocal part makes me think of. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and yeah. Um, the other part I heard you talk about was meeting needs. And I think that self-care can, uh, can be defined as meeting the needs of ourselves. You talked about providing your plant with everything it needs, water and sunlight. And I think that self-care can be defined as that. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. as humans also need water and sunlight. I feel like we're just glorified plants. <laughs> I do think we do. I was thinking about that today with the whole plant analogy. <laughs> we, yeah. The other thing that I think about self-care is that it's really multidimensional. So like with your plants that need light and water, those are taking care of your plant's physical needs. I don't know. Do plants also have emotional needs? I don't know. Maybe in 10, 15, 20 years, we'll find out. <laughs> I think they might. So in that regard, we are different with the plants because we do have a lot of emotional needs. I don't, yeah, yeah. We know, yeah. We know that our mental and emotional needs are extensive. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also think of ourselves as having spiritual needs. 
And spiritual could be defined. I mean, you can define it however you want. One way I define spiritual is connection. And so I can think of my spiritual needs as am I connecting with myself, connecting with others, connecting with nature? Am I connecting with the present moment? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. So I like to think of yeah. self care as multi dimensional. I really like what you say about the spiritual self care too, because I feel like that's a aspect that sometimes gets missed in in the recommendations of like, okay, get your body moving, get the right nutrition, get what you need uh, in terms of like being connected with your body. But there's so much that I feel like we as humans seek outside of ourselves as well. So um, I think that sense of awe in terms mm -hmm. of nature, connecting with nature mm -hmm. through awe and observation. Mm -hmm. And that brings us into mindfulness and being really aware mm -hmm. of what you're mm -hmm. seeing, what's around you. Mm -hmm. That's really grounding and connecting. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So along the lines of talking about how self-care is multidimensional, mind, body, spirit, let's talk about body first. And I would like to ask the folks in the chat to enter their favorite way to care for their body. Um, so I, while they're doing that, I will just tell a little story. I used to think my self-care was so top notch. And if anybody asked me about my self-care, I'd be like, man, my self-care is exquisite. <laughs> <laughs> so why, why am I depressed and anxious? And why do I have chronic pain and these other multitude yeah. of things? Well, one of the reasons is that I was only thinking of self-care as physical. And I would be like, yeah, I, you know, I listen to my body's hunger and fullness cues. I honor my body's need for food. I move my body. I get regular massages. I have, you know, superb sleep hygiene, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> But do I express my emotions to my friends? No, you know, so I really really thought that it was that self-care meant physical self-care yeah, yeah absolutely and i think that's a lot of the focus of our culture in general is um, on the physicality of self-care rather than also going back internally into what do you need and really reconnecting with who you are and becoming aware of those needs because that's one of the hardest things too i agree i agree Yulia, before we look at the chat, we're, we are talking about the importance of physical self-care right now. Do you have a favorite or a few favorites for physical self-care? Yeah, I, I'm a walker. I really like walking. So I try to get out every day, even if it's like 10, 15 minutes to get out there and, and just move. Um, oh, plus, important. there's a lot of really adorable cats in our neighborhood. So I get to pet them on my way, which is oh. a great bonus. Talk about physicality oh. and five senses. <laughs> I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. What about you, Anna? How are you engaging your physical body? Well, what I liked to do before COVID-19, I would get a massage once a month mm. and it's the best thing ever. Oh, and nice. even though I have chronic pain and other physical issues, we would never work on those physical issues. I would never be like, yeah, you know, fix my hip. It's out of whack. <laughs> it would always just be for relaxation. And that did so much for my well-being to have yeah, this yeah. massage just based on relaxation. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. So take a look at the chat and see what, what, what do we see there? Okay, so Rihanna says sleep. That's a great one. Absolutely, yes, it's so important. And speaking of Rihanna, she talked about sleep a lot, which makes sense <laughs> why she <laughs> says that sleep is the number one thing to help yourself uh, yeah, I kinda, boost your I, immunity, reconnect with your body. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and let's see, Katie says favorite ways to take care of herself is therapy. Yay, therapy, walking, smoothies, allowing myself to do nothing when I need to. That's a big one. That's so great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, rest. Uh -huh. Rest is very important. Yeah, uh, just being in that state where you don't 
need to do anything or don't just let yourself be instead of have to go and do a certain amount mm -hmm. of things is mm -hmm. a really big part of it yeah mm -hmm. um and then julie mentions also massage but not now right <laughs> um yep and sauna and not now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh exercise hot bath with epsom salts that's great. a good one uh cooking sleep meditation that's a great one too um and also lacking a mental health care she mentioned so but that's, that's a, okay yeah. that's okay julie we're totally just talking about the physical right now and next we're going to talk about the mental and then maybe other people will have some ideas maybe it'll spark some ideas that you've been using um so one thing i've been doing for muscles since i haven't been able to go get my massage is called progressive muscle relaxation have you heard of progressive mm. muscle relaxation yulia i have not i would love to hear about it it's a it's based on the theory that anxiety causes muscle tension which i would have to agree with that theory right absolutely yes and <laughs> there's then, no doubt it's based on the theory that through relaxing our muscles, we can reduce our anxiety, which totally makes sense mm. to me. Yes. And progressive muscle relaxation is going through your entire body, either head to toe or toe to head, kind of like a body scan, but clenching each muscle for a moment and then letting it go. So like if I was going to do progressive muscle relaxation with my hand, I would make a fist, hold it tight, and then let it relax. And I would do that all through my body with every muscle, like thinking of my thighs, I would straighten my knees, clench my thighs as much as I could, probably on the in-breath, and then let it go on the exhale. There's a bunch of good uh, guided progressive muscle relaxation, PMR, a bunch of good guided meditations on YouTube. You can do it from like five minutes to 15. Um, another thing I like to do for self care is wear clothes that fit. I feel like that's easier to do right now, right? Like I haven't gotten out <laughs> since quarantine. I haven't gotten out of these leggings with the stretch band. Yeah, yes. so that's a great Amen body. To that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, how about this? We just did it for your body. Laughter. Don't you think mm -hmm. laughter is great for your body? absolutely yes yeah. i mean all the well i was gonna say laughter releasing all the stress that is stored in your body and with that i would also say crying is really good to just release all that stress and tension like we literally shed cortisol when we cry so just let yourself cry that's yeah so good right now because we a lot of the times we will have those overwhelming mental health days where we just need to cry for however however long it takes that's beautiful. I'm so glad you said that. Right. I feel like we could go on and on with the physical ones. It's kind of what we do here at Circle. <laughs> so let's move on. I want you to enter in the chat your favorite way to take care of yourself mentally. Mm, I want to see those Yulia. responses. <laughs> Yulia, do you have a suggestion for favorite way to take care of yourself mentally? Oh, I have lots of suggestions. Yes. Um, I'm specifically thinking of your um, brain model. So particularly when you're in that high stress where your um, prefrontal cortex is not communicating with the rest of your brain. Um, I find that looking around the room and naming things and their colors is really helpful for me and to restore that blood flow to the front of the brain and um, kind of brings back the cognitive function. Um, or just naming things that start with a letter A. Or um, the other thing that I also do is tapping, emotional uh, focus technique. So that's really helpful. We can also link to all the things we're talking about in the chat later so that you folks right, can yeah. um, check those out. Um, but yes, tapping to release sort of the points where um, emotional tension might be stagnating. Um, and then just even wiggling your toes. Um, to like reconnect with the body or humming. There's lots of things. <laughs> I'm sure I look really fun if anyone would walk in on me. Like, what are you doing? I'm just reconnecting with my body and brain. It's great. <laughs> Why are you humming and wiggling your toes? <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> oh That's my God. Awesome. One of my favorite ones for mental self-care is to clean out a drawer. <laughs> 
<laughs> just, just one drawer. Because I feel like in times of overwhelm, when I'm mentally kind of stagnated, because I have so yeah. much going on up here, if I can just address one simple task from start to end and get that done, it actually mm -hmm. releases energy. I actually have more yeah. energy and more mental clarity. That's a great idea. I need to dedicate a specific drawer that I can mess up and then reorganize. <laughs> <laughs> as you an can't exercise. just pick a random drawer. Are all your drawers that clean? Well, let's not go into my drawers right now. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe I need to do this sooner than later. <laughs> oh man. Wanna take a look at some of other people's ideas for mental self-care? Let's see, yes. Oh, sleep cast on headspace, really helpful for me, says Katie. Um, yeah, I Headspace is a really great app and has a lot of good uh, meditation and mindfulness practices that we can engage in. So thanks for that tip, Katie. Um, Angela mentions watch less news. Yes, that yeah. is a great. Oh, yeah, that's so great. Oh my gosh. Um, keeping daily routines very important right now, considering there's a lot of uncertainty. So having that routine right now is going to be really yeah. good. Yeah. Um, let's see. Rihanna says journaling, connecting with friends yeah. via phone yep. right now. Yeah. Um, Julie loves the idea of cleaning out a drawer, by mm -hmm. the way, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to have a lot of organizing drawers going on in the next few days. <laughs> um, and let's see. Julie says, yes, taking a couple of days off toward the end of the month to clean out a whole room. So stepping it up, <laughs> moving from a drawer to a whole room. <laughs> awesome. Love it. Awesome, thanks for yeah. your participation, you guys. So we'll just touch quickly on the third one, which is spiritual self-care, uh, talking about connection. I guess you can just think in your head what you might do for connection right now. It might need to be modified while we're under quarantine, but how how can you connect? How can you connect with, with the present moment. I love what Yulia suggested about colors and shapes in the room. That's a way of connecting with the present moment. Connecting with nature. I bet for your walks outside, I bet it's not just the physical movement. I bet it's also the fact that you're outside. Absolutely, yes. I can just go into, so funny enough, I'm doing lots of research on benefits of nature and reducing anxiety. So um, it is scientifically proven that even 10 minutes outside will help you reduce those anxiety levels. So hearing the birds sing and just looking at the leaves, the colors in nature, and also just the lines in nature are very varied and mm -hmm. diverse versus mm -hmm. um, buildings are very, very straight. Yeah. And there's something to that diversity in lines is really helpful for our brains to kind of calm down and reconnect. So yes, nature is amazing. Yes. So I invite you all to think about spiritual connection and to think about all three, how self-care is multidimensional. Think about how you can modify your favorite self-care practices to work under this time of quarantine when our stress is very elevated and our access to our regular self-care routines might be diminished. How can we modify? And then I wanted to answer the second half of your question about what self-care is not. And I feel like we've been talking about that a little bit. Um, you mentioned buzzwords. And I often think people talk about self-care as if it's something from out there that we do to fix our bodies, to change ourselves, to change the way things are instead of more of an intrinsic thing that comes up because we love, care, and respect for ourselves just as we are now. Absolutely. So in answering what self-care is not, I guess I would just think about motivation. You know, what's your motivation? Yeah, that's a great point, Anna. And I was thinking about that too, in terms of um, how our culture markets self-care. It's um, there's almost a judgment to it. Like you're not doing enough self-care or you need to be doing more. And um, I feel like self-care is a very judgment-free zone um, because it's really just um, connecting with your needs and you don't need, you know, an ad to tell you what to do in order to self-care because you will be able to get in touch with yourself and figure that out for yourself because 
what someone else is doing is not necessarily going to work for you. So it's it's all about that intrinsic sense of you know interoception, getting in touch with your body. How does it feel? What does it need? Yes, I agree. I agree. And even if we don't feel that ushy gushy love for ourselves, because some lots of people, lots of humans, maybe wouldn't feel that type of love for ourselves. I still think that we can view self care as a practice and as an action. Yes. We can respect ourselves. We don't have to feel self-love first. We can practice the action of self-care first. And over time, that feeling of self-love might increase because of the nurturing, compassionate self-care that we're offering for ourselves. Absolutely, it's a great point. Yulia, uh, noticing the time, where yes. do you think we should head from here? <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out, Anna. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Well, we have probably about five minutes left. Um, so we are going to um, wrap this up and talk about sort of the, the top takeaways or top, um, I almost said giveaways, that's not the right word, takeaways. <laughs> so things you can take with you from, from our chat today. Um, so some of the things we mentioned, like we just talked about bringing the focus back to yourself and interoception. So, um, becoming, um, or making the self-care to the practice an everyday thing, like Anna was just saying, I think is a, one of the biggest takeaways too. Um, and then Anna, I think you have a few other ones for us, don't you? Yes, absolutely. And during this time, if you did have a question about what we've been sharing about so far, please put that in the chat and we can spend a couple minutes on questions. Um, but just for other takeaways, I wanted to touch base on what we talked about, about the triune brain model and about how what happens when we flip our lid and how that activates the sympathetic nervous system. I wanted to remind you about what Yulia said about how that's cyclical be going between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic and that's normal for it to be cyclical. So I'll, I can spend my day going into sympathetic, back into parasympathetic, into sympathetic. But the thing that happens with high stress is that the sympathetic activation just skyrockets, and then it can take a long time to get back into parasympathetic. So we discussed yeah. that. I would keep in mind about that, that awareness is the key. Being aware of your body. Like if I'm sitting at the computer for hours on end, being aware hey, I need to get up once an hour and do my stretches or do walk around, take care of myself. Yeah, absolutely, great point. And the other, uh, the other main takeaway is that self-care is multidimensional, right? It's mind, body, spirit. So it's not, all these wonderful things we do for our body are absolutely fabulous and it's not enough. I need to care <laughs> for my body. You know, I need to care for my mind. I need to care for my emotions. I need to care for my spiritual nature. So thinking of self-care as multidimensional. Yeah, absolutely. I don't see any questions popping up. Yeah, let me take a look at the chat here and see if folks have any questions. This is a good time to pop in and ask a few before we um, sign off. So um, I'll let folks kind of mingle and, and see if there are any questions and then I can um, just tell you a little bit more or actually invite Anna to, and Anna, how do people find you? Where do they find you? How do they schedule an appointment with you if they want to? And can you tell a little bit more about that? They should contact Historical Nutrition. <laughs> There you go, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I have some openings in my schedule. I'm doing telehealth. Um, it's a really great way to connect and have support. It's a great time to get into better self-care habits now while we have time. And then they can carry out forward. And as far as how to get in touch with Starkle Nutrition. I can talk about that. Yes. So um, you can just go to our website, starkelnutrition.com. Um, on our contact page, you can just fill out um, a form and get in touch with us. You can also give us a call. Um, our number is 206-853-0534. Um, you can email us at admin at starkelnutrition.com and we can get in touch with you. Um, yes, this is definitely 
I feel like this is a time where we need a lot of support um, from friends, from family, and from your nutritionist and mental health counselors this is a great time to, to be in touch with someone um, who's outside of your soul club as well. Um, and then I also invite you to like our Facebook page that you are on right now if you haven't already. And we also have Instagram, we have lots of other social media channels. So follow us, spread the word. Um, we'd really love to continue doing these nutrition ha happy hours, nutrition community hours, uh, whatever we want to call them, just to, to help folks feel supported and connected during this time. Thanks, All right, Julia. let's see, do we have anything? Yeah. Uh, well, we do have a question. Sure. Anna, would you mind giving some more spiritual examples of self-care? You bet. And just because of time, we kind of cut the spiritual one short, but I, we could have spent <laughs> more time talking about that. As far as how I divine, define spirituality as connection, um, I think of connecting with other people in the way of like helping other people. How can I be of service in the world? Um, we could think of it as reaching out and asking for help. Can I ask somebody for help in this world? I also think of spirituality as connection with my values. Like what are the five most things that are important to me? Can I connect with those? We get so busy in this society doing what we think we need to be doing. You know, I don't know, kind of mindlessly going <laughs> through life. Yeah. Can we stop sometimes and reconnect with our values? Reconnect with what is really important to us. I think, uh, gosh, I think lots of the spiritual kind of meld in with the mental and emotional and physical. Like I think connecting with my pets is really spiritual. You know, you're petting your cats on your walk that you were talking about. <laughs> um, yeah. Cultivating an attitude of joy can be spiritual, like can I make a gratitude list? Um, can I just go outside and appreciate? I also think what Yulia shared about crying, I think is very spiritual. So how can I connect with my grief and my sadness in this time? Making that type of a connection is spiritual. I yeah, hope that answers absolutely. the question. Okay. And I would throw another thing um, on top of that that is personally, to me, spiritually connecting is um, connecting with other people through vulnerable exchanges. Because I feel like there's a lot of surface interactions and what we really need right now is to be seen and to be heard. And so just showing up in, with vulnerability, with openness and genuine desire to hear what the other person has to say and also share what you have to say. Um, to me, like after that ex type of exchange, it can be spiritual for sure. I love that. I love that. Um, let's see. It is great that you are also a mental health counselor in addition to being a nutritionist. Yes. Yes. It's a double whammy. I think it's amazing. Um, okay. You, Angela sa says, thank you both. So helpful. Um, it's a pleasure, pleasure for us to do this. Anna, Anna, any thanks, last so much for joining us. <laughs> thanks so much for joining us today. It was really fun. It was a wonderful conversation. I look forward to talking to you all again. Yeah. Yes, and like I mentioned, we'll we'll post uh, links to some of the things we talked about um, in this um, chat. So check in in a few hours and uh, look for those links. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good day and do good self-care. Okay, thanks everybody. We'll look forward to talking again soon. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.